Okay, so welcome back. Um, so last time we talked about numerical criteria for ampleness, um, and we proved the Nakai Moishizan criterion. Uh, we didn't quite get to Kleinman's criterion, but so let me just kind of remind you what we're uh, talking about here is that the Nakai Moishizan criterion. says that a divisor slash line bundle is ample on a variety x if for every sub-variety, and now say so for every and only if for every sub-variety v, then v to the k dot v is positive you know, where k equals the dimension of b. Well, I could just write the dimension of b. It's a little clearer. Okay, and so then the idea is to say, all right, well, um, then the, the limits of ample divisors, to get those, you just replace this greater than symbol with a greater than or equal to symbol. So limits, we just have d to the dim v, uh, v is greater than or equal to zero. And so this numerical criterion tells you which divisors are in the closure of the, well, of the cone of ample divisors. I mean, we know it's a cone. We, uh, uh, what we're going to demonstrate next is that the uh, closure of the ample cone is the neph cone, and that the interior of the neph cone is the ample cone. So we say that D is depth if D dot C is greater than equal to zero for all curves. And Kleinman's criterion or Kleinman's theorem what it says is that this condition here you only need to check on curves. So if e dot c is greater than zero, then d to the dim v dot v is greater than equal to zero for all v. Okay, so this justifies all the things we've been saying about neph and ample uh, and how they're related. Um, and so one of the things I want to do today is prove this theorem here. And the other was I want to present uh, at least some of this example of a surface with ha which has a divisor that satisfies that's positive on every curve, but the divisor itself is not effective. And so it's not actually ample. So you have enough divisor that's so so in other words, you know, what you'd really like to say is that oh it suffices to check this for curves, but in fact that's not true. So so one of the little tricky things about the theory. So this is one of the things that makes NEF such a nice condition. Okay, so so we want to prove this statement here. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the Nakai Morshazon criterion to do that. So, uh, how is that going to work? Well, what we do is we is we consider start of the proof is we consider the divisor d plus th for t greater than zero, and let's see. So we want to assume inductively that the theorem is true up to a certain dimension. So we're going to assume by induction that d dot c being greater than zero for all c implies d dot v, d to the dim v, dot v greater than or equal to zero for uh, dim v less than n. 
where n is the dimension of our ambient variety. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the self-intersection numbers of this on various sub-varieties and work some magic. So here's the idea, is that, uh, so we consider d plus th to the n, and the idea is that this is, you know, if you squint at it, this is actually a polynomial in t. And so you can expand this as a polynomial in t, If t is large, then this ample term is going to dominate. And you know, so you're going to get like, you know, get to the d to the you get d to the n plus some terms in t. But what do we know about those terms? Well, they're all intersection numbers of d and h, right? And h is an ample divisor. So when you intersect it with itself, you get something that's, you know, that's an actual subvariety. So if you restrict d to that, then you have to get something non-negative. So we get d to the n is the constant term plus t, you know, plus, you know, you can just call them like a1t plus a2t squared plus all the way up through, you know, an t to the n. This is just h to the n. And all of these terms have positive coefficients, or uh, I guess I should say non-negative coefficients. And this one is certainly positive because it's uh, h to the n. This one is positive. So this means as you make t bigger, eventually it's going to become positive because the dominant term here has a positive coefficient. And so you can just say, well, let's let, uh, you know, if d to the n is non negative, then we're done because this was the only intersection number we had left to figure out what it was. So we can assume that d to the n is negative and proceed with a proof by contradiction. So we'll assume d to the n less than zero. So then this polynomial, when you plug in t equals zero, you get something negative, and when you plug in large t, you get something positive. So the intermediate value theorem says that somewhere, somewhere in the middle there is a zero. And we'll just think about the first zero you get. Uh, or, yeah, so, um, yeah, and so then you say, okay, well, you know, this is, so let's let zero be, um, in fact, because these are all non-negative, like, once this becomes zero, once this becomes non-negative, it's going to just be positive from then on. So there's just going to be one zero in the middle, and... So this will be the real zero of the above polynomial. Okay. All right, and so for so for t bigger than t zero, so let's just call this. Uh, I think they, okay, so I uh, forget exactly how Lazarus Fell labels these, but I think he calls this one P, and then we're going to have a Q and R later. So the idea is that P of 0 is negative, P of T0 is equal to 0, and P of T is positive for T greater than T0. Okay, so now I want to split this into two pieces. So I can say that, uh, well, d plus th to the n is certainly equal to d dot d plus th to the n minus 1 plus t times h dot d plus th to the n minus 1. And we just have to look at these and consider what each of these is doing as we vary t. Okay, so 
Um, yeah, so we know that. Uh, Are those n minus ones outside of parentheses on the right, right? Oh, uh, yeah, it should be outside of parentheses. There we go. Okay. So the point here is that if you let t be bigger than t0, so, so once t is bigger than t0, so you have that, you know, d to the n is, so if, uh, so basically like the, the nakai on criteria, if you just think about the smaller values of n, if you know, d to the n is positive on the thing, then so is d plus th to the n, or uh, to the, okay, so like, the, the idea is that, that, uh, yeah, so the, so the idea here is that this guy satisfies the positivity condition we want by the induction hypothesis. And, you know, over here, that guarantees that this term is positive. So we have that this one is positive because, well, we have that d plus th is, um, you know, so th this is actually going to give us an ample class, um, and that's going to uh, be positive on h. Um, but, you know, this one is also positive. And the idea is that, you know, as you send t to t0, then you're supposed to get 0, but then this guy is positive. Uh, this guy, here what we have is we have a curve restricted to d, so this has to be greater than or equal to 0. And so we get a contradiction because at t0, we get that this is greater than or equal to zero, this one is positive, and so then we have that d plus t zero h to the n is, uh, you know, this is equal to, you know, this will be greater than or equal to zero plus positive, and it's greater than zero, which is a contradiction. Okay, so basically we can use the nakai on criterion to then produce this, uh, this really nice criterion where you only have to check what's happening on curves. Okay, so questions here? Let's see. Did I, did I adequately justify why this is positive? Because I think, let's see, what's the idea here? Well, the idea is that, you know, if you say that, uh, that if you take, so that, uh, so the, the point is if you take d plus th, and you take powers of that, and you restrict it to all the subvarieties, because for h that thing is positive, and for d that thing is not negative, then when t is positive, you're always gonna get something positive there. So it passes everything in the nakai moishe zone criterion except its full power, but then we know that this one is positive for t greater than t0. So the conclusion is that, I guess I should have said this here, is that the chi moishe implies that d plus th is ample for t greater than t0. And that's why we're allowed to say, oh, well, this one, you just get some curve, so when you restrict it to d, it's non-negative. And here I'm restricting this curve to an ample divisor, so I get something positive. So that's where these two bounds come from. And the place where we used the kind of on was that we were able to say that d plus th is ample because we know that d, you know, if you just look at the powers of d, they're positive and the powers of h are, the powers of d are not negative, and the powers of h are positive. So putting that all together, uh, you get that d plus th is ample for t greater than this bound. And then you say, oh, well, that bound actually had to be at t0 equals 0.
Okay, so any questions? So, yeah, just a clarifying question. So, we're doing induction on the dimension of V? The dimension of X. So, we're doing the ambient dimension is yeah. what we're doing induction on. That's right. So, the point is that, because the idea is that you can think of it as, I know that my divisor D restricts to an ample divisor on everything smaller because by the inductive hypothesis. So you say that, well, it restricts to a neft divisor, rather. So the idea is like you restrict it to co-dimension one, and in co-dimension one, you know, whatever that is, it's non-negative on, on all the curves, so it's a neft divisor there. And so that's, that's how the induction works. Yeah. Right, it's clear enough. Thank you. Yeah. So we're inducting not on the dimension of the sub-variety, but on the dimension of the ambient variety. Other questions? So the contradiction is, I mean, it gives contradiction to the fact, to the assumption that d to the n is negative, right? Uh, that's right. But this imply already implies this uh, criterion, or I mean? Uh, yeah, because all we had to show was that, because by induction, d to the k restricted to every sub variety of dimension k, mm -hmm. so every strict sub variety, that that was not negative. So the only one that can go wrong is this one. So like, what are we assuming about D? We're assuming D is non-negative on every curve, so that's neph. And then we're also assuming that it has this, I guess maybe we'll call it Nakai Morshazan neph. So it's Nakai Morshazan neph on all of the sub varieties. And then we prove, oh, it's Nakai Morshazan neph on the entire thing via this argument. And so it's clear that the kai is on neph implies neph, and then the point of this theorem is that converse is also true. The thing that's nice about this theorem is that checking on curves is way easier than checking all of the intersection numbers. You know, it's somehow, you know, higher intersection numbers, you know, it can get kind of messy thinking about those, but just thinking about the pairing between divisors and curves is quite straightforward. So, quick corollary of this is that, let me give you two corollaries. And again, this is the same kind of argument, is to say that, you know, D neph implies that the intersection numbers of D on every subvariety are not negative, and then putting this th makes them just a little bit positive, and so Nikai Morshazan tells you that this is ample. But again, the nice thing is that, oh, I just have to check that, you know, that, that this guy is not negative on every, on every curve, and then I just tweak it a little. Another corollary, which is sort of neat, but I don't know if I've ever, well, I don't know, I can't, like, maybe, maybe this does get used, um, is to say that um, divisor D is ample if and only if uh, there exists an epsilon greater than zero such that uh, I think it's supposed to be d dot c over h dot c is greater than epsilon for some 
matrix ample H and all curves C. Okay, so here, I mean, you can just see this just follows from the previous one because if I rearrange the inequality, what I get is that I get D dot C minus H dot C, uh, sorry, minus epsilon H dot C is non-negative. And then this divisor is nef, so then I recover the original D by adding a tiny ample divisor to a nef one, so it's ample. So the thing that's annoying here is that you have this epsilon, right? You would really prefer if it was just like, oh, I just had to check greater than zero, but it's just not true. So in the remaining time, I'm going to try and present uh, the counterexample that's in Lazarsfeld, but it's actually like quite tricky. Um, so I went and did some digging and basically just followed up the references. And so he references a paper of Hartshorn, Hartshorn who, where he uh, uses this classification of stable bundles due to uh, Narasimha and Sashadri. And when I followed up on that paper, I was like, okay, well, why does this, you know, I, I get to the proof and I'm like, why is this, what makes the machine go? And they say, well, we prove by induction and the n equals one case is like classical. Here's a reference. And then I couldn't uh, dig up the, the, the next reference because I couldn't find the paper online. But, uh, you know, so that was sort of annoying, but, uh, and I don't want to get like too far afield. Um, so I'll just kind of give, state the results, kind of give a flavor of what's going on and hopefully that'll satisfy us. Um, so the thing that's, kind of sticky about this, at least for me, one of the things is that you need to use this theorem that stable bundles come on curves come from um, unitary representation, representations of the fundamental group, which is, I mean, it's like, you can kind of understand some intuition behind it, but I, like, I, I couldn't quite figure out like why unitary is the right condition as opposed to, you know, some other condition on matrices. So, um, I will try and walk through some of that today. Okay, but for starters, let's just talk about uh, the NEF cone of a ruled surface. And so the idea is that to produce a ruled surface, what you'd like to have is uh, well, you start with a, a projective curve, and then you start also with a vector bundle of rank two on that curve. So let's let C be uh, a projective curve. Now, for the moment, I'm not going to require anything about the genus, but in a bit, we're going to want it to be of general type. Um, and let Script E be a rank two vector bundle. Okay, and I'm going to, you know, for my sanity's sake, just to sort of clear, like keep things simple, I'm going to assume that the first turn class of this vector bundle is zero. But he, you know, so, so this is not really that crazy of an assumption because, well, if the first turn class is odd, then you can make it, you, you know, you can make it like to be one. Uh, that is like it's just the vanishing top of the logical vanishing of a single point. Um, and then if it's like even degree, you can just twist it to get it down to here. If it's odd degree, you can twist it to get it down to one. And you know, the theories, you know, they're. It's, you know, it's the same theory. I just want to make my life a little simpler today. Okay, and so the idea is we say that E is stable if whenever we have a non-zero morphism which is automatically injective because it's from a line bundle. So whenever we have a morphism from a line bundle to our guy, 
then the degree of L uh, has to be negative. Okay, and you know, there's a more general definition of this, but you know, it's, you know, it's, it's just basically you, you want to say like stability is saying that you don't have any sub bundle that's too positive. Okay, and then and then semi stable. That's the same, but the degree of L has to be less than or equal to zero. Okay, so what's the idea here? Well, so two examples. We take c equal to p1, uh, and then you know Grothendieck's theorem of vector bundles on p1 says that every vector bundle on p1 splits. Uh, now there's a kind of a nice you know so you can't use that when you get the higher genus curves, but you like when you're manipulating turn classes of vector bundles, you can kind of pretend it splits. This is called the splitting principle, but for the actual like algebraic messing around that it might not. Okay, so here every bundle splits. And so I have, in fact, that there are no strictly stable bundles on P1 because of the splitting. So the, the point being that if you have one of turn class zero, then the, two, the degrees of the bundles you're summing together have to sum to zero. So the only semi-stable bundle For example, we might take O1 plus O minus 1. This is not stable. And you can plainly see why it's not stable is that you have this O of 1 inside. So this is called the destabilizing subsheaf. Okay, so note here that it doesn't preclude having that you can have more and more negative things inside. So for example, you have, if you think of the Euler sequence for P1, and there's an O of minus one inside here, and then you map one by multiplying by X, the other multiplying by Y, the quotient is O of one, and this kind of, you know, tells you, like, this is gonna present for you the, uh, um, you know, if you twist that sequence, it'll give you the canonical sheaf. Okay, so, now the point being that in terms of the net or ample cones, you could understand divisors on the corresponding ruled surface in terms of maps like these. So the idea is that let's just let S sub uh, E equal uh, the ruled surface corresponding to the vector bundle E. Um, yeah, so this, you can think of it just as the uh, space of one-dimensional quotients over C. So, you know, but this is really just, you know, prog of, uh, I guess it's the symmetric algebra, yeah, over C. Okay, so now the, uh, the point of all this is that We want to know what does the net cone, or what does the effective cone look like? Well, the effective classes are just going to correspond to uh, yeah, you can get those just in terms of uh, quotients of the sym this symmetric bundle here. So, uh, in particular, the uh, so you have 
let's just say that e is equal to o of 1 for this p of e, and then f is just the fiber. And then in this case, we're going to have e squared um, because I chose, you know, it's, that's going to be give, that's going to look like my term class here. So in this case, it's just going to be c1, which is just equal to zero, and then f squared is also equal to zero, and then I get e dot f is equal to one. So the picture that I get is I always get my fiber here. And then I always get, um, you know, and then I also get a class E here, which may or may not have sections. And then I can just um, read off from stability data what other sections I have. So in particular, if, uh, if my vector bundle is stable, or let's say semi-stable, then the symmetric powers are also going to be semi-stable. And so that's going to guarantee I don't get anything outside of here. So then this is my effective cone. Which, you know, it may or may not include this ray E, as we'll see. Um, and then this is also just the closure is going to be the nef cone. Whereas if I look at an unstable bundle, it looks pretty different. What happens is that I get my f, my e, and then I get an arrow out here, which is going to correspond to this destabilizing section. So this I'll just call it, you know, uh, this d for destabilizing. And what we know about d is that d squared is going to be negative. So if I did this for O of 1 plus O of minus 1, the d squared I would get would be minus 2. Um, and yeah, so it's, you know, you can work it out in terms of the, how, the, how the bundle splits what the d squared is. So this d squared is negative. And then, you know, within here, you know, so if d squared is negative, and d dot f is 1, then, you know, somewhere in here, we have an f code. Okay, so here, you know, you'll get kind of a, a nice, uh, you know, and then the interior of the nef cone is the ample cone. Right here, the interior of the nef cone is the ample cone. Um, and then what you can see here is that along this line E, then if you apply the Kleiman criterion badly, you can say, oh, well, this class E is NEF because it's, you know, it's, um, let's see, do I want, yeah, so it's positive here, and it's zero here, so it's not negative on the whole cone, and if you say, oh, well, let's just test it on all the curves. If there's no curves in here, then all the curves lie above there, so then E would be positive on every curve. So this would get us a surface where you have a divisor that's positive on every curve, but not ample. So if, if no power, uh, if no multiple of E is effective, over here, then E dot C is positive for all curves C, but E is not ample. Okay, so we just have to cook up such a, such a line and such a vector bundle that has this property. And the thing that we need the vector bundle to have as a property is that the vector bundle is strictly stable. So if you're strictly stable, if you're just semi-stable and you have a section that uh, you know, doesn't quite destabilize, that has exactly the right degree, that's going to correspond to a section along this array. 
And then likewise for the powers of the vector bundle. So the symmetric powers, sim 2 corresponds to 2 times e, sim 3, 3 times e, etc. So if we want to cook up an example with this property holding, what we need to have happen is that all of the symmetric powers of e are themselves strictly stable. Or I guess I should just say stable. Okay, so here's where we have to invoke this uh, theorem that Correspondence between stable bundles of rank, uh, let's just say rank n, and reps of unitary reps of dimension n. this to have c1 equals 0. Uh, okay, so in fact the theorem is a little bit stronger than this. There it's, you know, you can, uh, you, you twist, you sort of twist the representation a little bit by kind of putting it in an orbifold, orbifold point. Uh, if you want the c1 to be between 0 and the, and the negative of the rank, and then to get everything else you can twist by positive or negative degree line bundle. Okay, so, yeah, I'm not going to prove this theorem. I wanted to kind of come up with some intuition as to why it was true, um, but unfortunately that was not something I really succeeded at. Um, I mean, you can kind of see why, you know, you'd have a correspondence like this. I mean, forget the stable part, but just like why this would give you a vector bundle, because the idea being that, you know, you have your curve, which has some... Uh, um, you know, it has some disks on it, right? And you just sort of break it apart into disks. And then pi 1 is saying, okay, well, we're thinking about the universal cover, which is, you know, for, oh yeah, this just should be for C and D at least 2. Um, I think, you know, something similar works for G equals 1. It's just, uh, when G equals 2, the universal cover is the, uh, you know, the Poincaré disk. And then for G equals 1, the cover is just flat and uh, complex space. And so here, you know, above each point on my curve or each neighborhood, I have, you know, a whole, I have my universal cover. And then the idea is that I'm assigning a vector space to each guy in the universal cover. But then to get a vector space here, I have to identify them. And so it's like, oh, I'm dragging the vector space along, along some path. And then this corresponds, you know, I have some path gamma, and then I'm just saying, well, I apply a row of gamma to my vector space. And then the path is a loop, then I get back to here, and, you know, this is where the representation comes in. Okay, so then it's like, well, why unitary? Because, and I was trying to figure this out, and I think, you know, it's, you know, I, I, can't, I mean, don't quote me on this, but it seems like a version of the Riemann Hilbert correspondence. And, you know, for there, that's like between local systems and, uh, I guess, coherent sheaves or something. And so it looks kind of, you know, very similar, right? And, and the point is that, uh, you know, there you have all this stuff with like connections and stuff, but it's like if you have like a Hermitian uh, metric on the line bundle, then um, you know, then that comes with a connection sort of automatically, and so then it's sort of plausible that you get this. Um, now, you know, when they proved this, they said, well, we'll do induction on the rank, and the rank one case is trivial. Well, it's not trivial, but it's classical. It's like, you know, already known. And it's at least plausible because what happens when n equals 1? Well, when n equals 1, then every bundle is stable, 
because there's no sub bundles and the uh, and then you say okay well that's just a line bundle right well the line bundles of degree zero of, of uh, you know topological degree zero are the ones where you know they make up the Jacobian and so then you say okay well I have a unitary representation of pi one well okay so one dimensional unitary representation is just for each of those guys you get a point on the circle and it's a commutative group so you don't have to worry so you you sort of push everything through the fundamental group to the first homology group and so then you're saying okay well for every you know i i write down a basis of loops on my thing and there's 2g loops so i have a product of 2g circles which is exactly what the jacobian looks like it's a complex torus of uh, complex dimension g and real dimension 2g but you know, this is one of these things where, you know, that's, you know, it says, well, it looks like we got the right answer, but, you know, that's not really proof, right? Um, so, yeah, this is something, if any of you, like, see, like, ah, an enlightening reason why this is true, you know, in, in n equals one, please let me know, because I was, you know, trying to work this out myself and, um, you know, didn't make a lot of progress, but, I think this is like, you know, part of the bigger story and should be related to like this Riemann Hilbert correspondence and uh, similar types of things, like this whole story with Higgs bundles and all that. It seems a lot like uh, this gauge theory of Donaldson on computer, right? So yeah, I mean, I think stable right twos to, you know, any self dual connections. Yeah, I mean, I think this is part of this whole story. I mean, I think, in fact, Donaldson gave another proof of this by showing something like, it, it's something like that every stable bundle has like a unique unitary connection or something like that. This is kind of another way to say this. Um, yeah, and it's sort of a, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty non-trivial statement and, but it, it would just be nice to have an intuitive understanding when n equals one, right? But yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good thing to bring up is that uh, that there's a there's a proof by Donaldson of this from you know they're kind of like these guys are coming from the sort of complex geometry perspective and Donaldson I think is working from the uh, kind of more differential geometry perspective. Okay, so in the last uh, seven minutes, let me just say a little bit about you know blackboxing this theorem. Let's see if we can then cook up a bundle or at least see why it's plausible that one could cook up such a bundle. Um, this is what Hertzorn does in his paper. Yeah, so the idea is that, you know, you have, um, Yeah, so, so, like, what do you have, like, what is, how do you present the fundamental group of this guy? Well, what do you have is you just have, uh, you know, for, let's say, g equals 2, you have uh, an octagon where, let's see, I forget exactly how you do the sides. I think it's, you just have alpha 1, beta 1, alpha 1 inverse, beta 1 inverse, alpha 2, beta 2, uh, alpha 2 inverse, beta 2 inverse, and the condition is that as you go around all the way around, you get the identity. And so I can promote these to matrices. These will be 2 by 2 matrices. So the point here is you can just kind of, you know, because the matrices don't actually have to commute, right? You can say, okay, well, you know, maybe my A1 is diagonal, my B1 is not, and then I just sort of 
you know, I kind of mess around with matrices A2 and B2 so that they become, so that they make this condition hold true. And so it turns out that you can kind of pick, you know, you can pick A1 to be diagonal and B, B1 to be kind of whatever you want. So you can choose A1 diagonal, and then of course, you know, B1 has to be, and then B1 is like any unitary. And you can cook up such a representation. And the point now is you want to show that the symmetric powers of this guy are still irreducible. But, okay, so the point of choosing A1 diagonal is that, you know, and I want it diagonal with, you know, different eigenvalues. You know, so, you know, you know I want it to, like, not be rid of unity or something. So, you know, you have, like, one in lambda where lambda is some transcendental number. And so then what's going to happen is that uh, when you take the symmetric powers of A, the diagonal elements are just going to be the powers of that other parameter. And there's going to be, you know, so, and I picked a transcendental, so there's not going to be like, you won't wrap back to one or anything like that. So I guess I could have just, yeah, you can just pick it to be any kind of point on the unit circle that's not a root of unity. Okay, so, and the reason I do that is so that, like, there's only one eigenbasis for A. Okay, and so then, you know, as long as B1 isn't block diagonal, then we're done. Or as long as the symmetric powers of B aren't block diagonal, then we're done. But that's just going to follow from the fact that we picked it really generically, because the, uh, the entries of the symmetric powers, they're going to be polynomial in the powers of B1, and then you can just guarantee that, that enough of those polynomials don't vanish. So by just picking this more gen generally enough, the symmetric powers of uh, B1 are not block diagonal. And then if this if we say that B is our representation, then sim and B is irreducible for and this is what we needed, it was just that we had an irreducible representation, because it's automatically unitary, of course, you know, once you, you know, because you're taking symmetric powers of representations of a particular group. Okay, so this was, you know, a bit of a journey, um, and it's a little unsatisfying, right, because you have to kind of invoke this other story that's going on that's, you know, <clears throat> you know, you know, this requires, like, you know, some kind of analysis to really make this happen. Um, and at least uh, when my copy of Lazarsfeld was printed, and I think this is still true, we don't have an example of this behavior in positive characteristic. So if you had kind of a more purely algebraic version of this, or maybe you do the same construction but you do some magic depending on the Frobenius, which is kind of, you know, that's kind of the p-adic, the, the characteristic p version of Hodge theory is sort of messing around with Rubinius. Um, and you might be able to produce an example in positive characteristic. And that's just, I, as far as I know, that's not known, an example of, you know, uh, a ruled surface with this property in characteristic P, because in positive characteristic, it's sort of hard to make things not vanish. Whereas, like, in characteristic zero, you just say, well, I just avoid countably many things, and now, I'm fine, but in positive characteristic, you don't have that luxury all the time. Okay, so I'd better stop here because we're out of time. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so next time I'd like to get into the cone theorem. So that'll be for next time. <laughs>